What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for listening to Nerdy 430, the podcast where comedian Tim Kack and I nerd out about topics for about 30 minutes. Uh, my name is Kevin Bauer, and today we are talking about a show. It's been out for a while. We've been sitting on this one. We've been stewing on it. But I got to let you know, if you have not seen the finale of Hawkeye yet, that came out on, I believe, December 15th, almost a full month ago. Spoiler warning. We are going to be talking about what happens in Hawkeye episode six today. So if you haven't watched it, make sure you watch that first. If you don't want to hear anything that you haven't seen yet. Uh, Tim, what did you think about this thing, man? Oh, better late than never, Kevin. We've been, we've been, we both took a little <laughs> break around the holidays. Little did I know it'd be the busiest time of the year for podcasts similar to ours. So <laughs> better, better late than never. We are back in full swing talking about what I would say, hands down, is the best Marvel show by far. By far. It's head and shoulders above everything else. And you know what, Kevin? The finale was so good. That despite it, I still think <laughs> the rest of the show is the best show I've ever seen, right? All the finale had to do was not blow it, and they kind of did that. Uh, it was probably the worst episode, but also was still really fun. I don't know. I, I enjoyed the heck out of this. I'm going to watch it again. I haven't watched any of the other TV shows again. I haven't wanted to watch any of the other TV shows again. This one, I'm telling you, every year I'm watching this thing. It's going to be great. It's a part of my life now. There you have it. It is a new, it's definitely a new Christmas tradition. This is in the rotation now. The show is so much fun. Uh, and I think, you know, like you said, it's other shows have covered this shit enough already. We can get right to the hot stuff. Uh, this is definitely the worst episode of Hawkeye. There's no question. This is the worst one of the series so far. It is still head and shoulders the best finale to a Disney Plus show so far. Everybody creamed their jeans over Vision saying that what is grief but love persisting look that quote is fine it's an okay quote <laughs> but what if but what if hawkeye had said something cool like you know if you have one boat and then you take it apart and you build an, and you replace the parts and you build another boat with the old parts is it still the same boat how profound would that be kevin how mind-blowing would that be if hawkeye had said something so deep uh that's my attempt at referencing the vision they had some speech about a boat, rebuilding the boat. Do you remember that? Your eyes are yeah. glazing over. Mine are glazing over because that was boring as fuck. Hawkeye, on the other hand. Dude, ideally, to me, that's how Hawkeye would have resolved the fight with Yelena. <laughs> he just brings up the ship of Theseus. Uh, that's like the new, it's the ultimate nullifier for the MCU. Um, little little drop for the comics heads out there. Uh, dude, the fucking, all right, let's, I think the owl moment that Jeremy Renner had in this episode where it's like Hawkeye falling through the tree and he sees an owl and just kind of has like a cute five seconds with that owl. I think that is better than the quote about grief. Just the moment, the it's lingering unique. eye contact with the owl. Yeah. I, we texted about this too. I yeah. think that moment, I think Jeremy Renner, that is the best acting I've ever seen from him. That is the most bizarre take on how to act in that scene. He just has this little like cutesy moment with an owl. It's insane. It completely works somehow. I don't think anybody else would have played that the same way. I've never liked him more as an actor. Jeremy Renner is a huge winner from this series. I want to see Jeremy Renner again, which is not something I've said after any other movie I've seen Jer Jeremy Renner in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it I don't I don't love him. He's got an unlikable face. I think he just looks like he's going to be a douchebag to talk to. Right. Like he looks like there's no way it's, he's fun. I feel like. But I mean, he had an app that was all about him. <laughs> That's not a good sign. I mean, did you see his like he had like some whiskey he was promoting or whatever. And it's like singer, actor, director. And it's like, dude, you're one of those things. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's be honest. Stop marketing yourself as a triple threat. All right. Will Smith is barely a triple threat. Oh my like, God. What are you talking about Jeremy Renner. You weren't in the same league as these guys. Oh, my God, dude. Is it like multi hyphenate whiskey? <laughs> Something, yeah. Triple barrel aged for this triple threat. <laughs> but damn it. If I didn't like him in this, I enjoyed him a lot i thought he was great this was like the hawkeye i wanted man he just is so good at being like resigned 
to everything. He's such a good older like mentor who doesn't want to be there, but then like reluctantly accepts the help. I mean, he was just crushing it. He just did a great job. And Kate was killing it. She's so good. Oh, she's so good. Haley Steinfeld is in the absolute top tier of Marvel casting to me. Like Chris Evans, Captain America. They found a way they found a guy that could make who could very well be an extremely boring character, extremely compelling. It's entirely in the way Chris Evans plays it. I think Um, Haley Steinfeld was just born to be Kate Bishop. Is this is this the best origin in Marvel? Is this the best introduction to a character we've gotten? Because it's it's got to be up there, right? As far as like instantly falling in love with somebody like Thor got his own movie. I can't say that character was really nailed down right away. Feels like she's got Mm -hmm. it. Like this is who the character is. I mean, her and Yelena are like the two characters most recently that they show up and it's like, fuck. Yeah, it is on. I love this person. I am all in on this person. I'm all in on this character. I want to see more of them. And I mean, you know, hindsight's 2020, but outside of Iron Man, like, I don't know if we've really had that same fire with all these other guys. Maybe I'm, I don't know. Maybe I'm bullshitting there, but I don't know, man. The list to me is like in terms of introductions and like nailing the characters immediately. The list for me is Chris Evans, Robert Downey Jr., Kate Bishop, like Haley Steinfeld is absolutely in the conversation for the best intro to a character in the MCU. Uh, Damn. I mean, Yelena, to me, too, I think I liked Yelena coming out of Black Widow. I love her coming out of this show. The chemistry between these two is so good. And I feel like they did that thing where it's like a lot of times I feel like what they'll do with the MCU is they'll cast someone and it's a good casting, but they kind of need that first project out of the way so that by the time the second project comes around, they've really crystallized what it is. Mm -hmm. Like, I think they're really good at identifying what works and what doesn't work and just leaning into the strengths. I remember even Tom Holland in Civil War. uh, He kind of annoyed me. Ant-Man was my favorite, like the surprise relief character in that movie. And I found myself relating more to him than to Tom Holland. Tom Holland felt like a real high schooler, which was cool for Peter Parker. But in that same way, he seemed kind of obnoxious in the way that a high schooler would. And I came away from that. Like, I don't know if I'm really going to relate to him in the MCU, but we're talking about No Way Home later. So we'll get to that when we get to that. But you're right. By the time he got to his solo movie, it felt like he had it down. I mean, Black Panther is another movie that like doesn't skip a beat. We are in Wakanda. We are in T'Challa's house. He knows who he is. He's he's crushing it. But he got that kind of you're right. He did get that kind of taste from another film. He just I mean, he showed up in Civil War for a, a hot 10 minutes and then bounced to his own film. And it seemed like that extra time just with the character just really made him made him flourish. Let's get into some takes because I got him. Oh, you want to lead off here? Kingpin, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> Kingpin, I don't like this. We are in agreement on this, and I feel like you and I are the only people on the planet Earth who think that this interpretation of the Kingpin is poor. I don't know what Vincent D'Onofrio is doing. I don't like it. I don't like how sad he was in Daredevil. I don't like the whole like, you know, staring at a at, at snow and just kind of whispering to himself. I don't like it. Michael Clark Duncan was a better kingpin. Like, in, oh, he was so good. He was great. I want that. I want big. I want powerful. And they did something at the beginning of this, like the finale, where I thought he was going to be big and powerful. I liked his fit. I liked that, like Hawaiian shirt from the Spider Man cover. That was cool. And then it all kind of fell apart for me. I think I, I said offline. I don't understand if if the big bad that Hawkeye is so scared of is the kingpin. I don't know why he's scared of him. And after watching this whole series, I still don't know why Hawkeye is scared of the kingpin. I mean, there's, there's no reason for him to be scared of this guy, especially like, Oh no, he's going to come after my family. What happens then? Well, you call Thor or you, or or, I don't know, you kill the kingpin. You you're a master archer. You're telling me you can't put an arrow through his eye from like 300 feet away. Like you're, you're fucking Hawkeye. Like, how can you not, you know, defend your own property from the kingpin? This whole series was about how he is a living weapon (laughs) and how he's trying to atone for the fact that he just 
brutally murdered what I'm assuming was tens of thousands of people (laughs) during the five years. He had five years to just slaughter people, you know, like there's so much blood on his hands. And that's also fine, by the way. We at the end of the series, we learn like, that's okay. That's not going to be a problem for him at all. It's not going to bite him in the ass in any way. Oh, my God, dude. Yeah, it's that relationship is so bad that it is almost a plot hole. Uh, why the fuck you would be scared of him in the same vein. I, I really, I didn't really buy the relationship between Vera Farmiga and the Kingpin. And I guess more generally Vera Farmiga's entire, like the character's entire dealings with the underworld. I didn't feel like it was a very good payoff to have her immediately trying to get out. It's like, I kind of want to see if the, if the split at the end of the series is going to be that Kate and her mom are on opposite sides of the law and Kate is showing that she is like, she's showing that she's a strong hero. She has a backbone by slapping the cuffs on her own mom. Like I want to see a little bit more dramatic tension there. We've seen how good Kate is. We need to see how bad Vera Farmiga is. We need like a body count. We need to see her do some fucked up shit in order to really get that tension. I didn't feel it. Yeah, right. Story is just conflict, right? So what's yeah. what, we want to know the story of uh, Kate's mom and the Kingpin. All we just we basically just smash cut to her telling the Kingpin, I don't want to do this anymore. Do this. Do what? As far as we know, you killed one guy. And then you've been, what, an accountant for this guy for a decade? (laughs) Like, what have you what have you done? You know, (laughs) what did you do for him? Were you laundering drugs? What was going on? How hard was it for you to get away from the kingpin? How hard was it for you to turn your back on him? And why were you working with him in the first place? We have a a shit ton of questions that I would I think would make a compelling show. (laughs) You know, if what if what if we what what if we as the audience knew she was the bad guy from the jump? And in the background of all these episodes, instead of using the swordsman is this like I I did kind of like the fact that they used him as like a uh, a red herring, like his character was great. Mm -hmm. The swordsman so entertaining. I want more of him for sure. But like, what if we get that peak, you know, as an audience to see that Vera Farmiga is the bad guy the whole time? We see her dealings. We see her committing these atrocities or whatever, because then we see how hard it is for her to get out. Or what she's giving up. Mm -hmm. Same thing with like Kate Bishop, like turning her mom in. It's just like a fact that she's going to turn her mom in to the police that she's. But is that hard for her to do? (laughs) Like, was it hard for her? It doesn't seem hard for her. It seemed like that's what was going to happen. And that's what heroes do, you know? So they definitely dropped a lot of stuff that could have been cool. But I mean, at the same time, it was still enjoyable. You know, it's mostly most of the stuff is like most of my problems with this show are like, I want more is just more, more, more. Give me more. Give me more. And I think if you're ultimately looking at something that's not the worst problem to have is wanting to spend more time with these characters and learn more about all this stuff. But but it's weird in a show where we want so much more out of it that so much time was seemingly wasted on a few different things. First of all, Tim, when did you know Ooh. that the watch didn't matter at all? <laughs> uh, probably when everybody else did, which is when you had to Google what the watch meant. I think <laughs> talk about like a week, <laughs> a week ass finale for your oh. story when like, oh, she gets the watch and it's like. OK, so what is what does this mean? This is nothing like yeah, what's the I did kind of assume I got that, this when I was 19. It is like a chunky man's Rolex, too. I thought I remember I feel like initially it was like a big watch. And then it's just like not that not that women can't wear big watches. They can do they can do anything they put their minds to. Kevin, that's the number one thing we want to reinforce <laughs> here. on Nerdy Christ. Nerdy. <laughs> if that uh, includes wearing a, 2022, wearing a chunky watch, you can wear it. Everybody can, you know, Kevin, if you want to wear a dainty little Apple watch, you can do that. That's <laughs> your ability and your right, uh, right. You've been, you know, exercising for the last decade. But like, who, who care? Kind of who cares about it? Kind of who cares about the watch? I don't I didn't care. It wasn't it wasn't super interesting. Uh, is it going to build to something? Are we going to see her be a badass? Could we see a fight at the Barton Farm? That would be cool. But like. I don't know. Again, I want more. I just want more from it. You're right. It didn't matter at all. I got another one for you. Ooh, keep going, bud. When did you know 
that the extremely dangerous arrow is just a normal exploding arrow. <laughs> that was a problem too. Why is it? What's the difference? What's the difference between that and the the arrow that Hawkeye shoots immediately before that scene, which is just an exploding arrow? There's none. You can't do. You cannot give us the Pym growth arrow in episode three after telling us that there's one that is so dangerous that she can't even fire it. And then she fires it in the finale. And it's just a normal, small, explosive arrow. If you you have to give us the craziest shit last. That's textbook man she's in the room with it right yeah like she's next she's like 20 feet away from the most dangerous arrow ever when it goes off also like they never really established in daredevil how kingpin got powers or what exactly those powers are right he's just a big guy he got a power boost in this for sure He's definitely stronger in this than in the previous thing. I think they're just I think it's just the the power of transferring to the MCU like makes you makes you stronger. You know, <laughs> you they've been training with weights on over on Netflix for years. Daredevil like almost beat him to death. And now he's, you know, probably with sta- he's getting shot in the chest with arrows. That's not a problem. He's standing on top of explosions. He's getting hit by cars. None of these are things that like Netflix Daredevil, you know, Wilson Fisk was capable of, in my opinion. But or they didn't they, at least they didn't put him out there like that. But the idea that he's standing on top of a whole quiver of arrows, including the most dangerous arrow ever. I was expecting like a black hole or something <laughs> like something I know, really, man. really effing scary. Well, there's I think one of the arrows maybe said Stark Tech on it. Uh, they had the knocks that were labeled and it was like I was like, holy shit, this is exactly what Tim asked for. It's he has different arrows in the quiver that were made in collaboration with different Avengers. And I kept thinking, like, what's the dangerous one? Is it like Wakandan? Like, what is this going to be? And yeah, no, it's it's just a bomb. Um, maybe it was a dirty bomb. <laughs> it looked like just a bomb, but uh, that's. That's sad. Uh, yeah, it'd be funny if it was just how? napalm or something like that. <laughs> 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 just like a war crime arrow. And he's like, you know, you can use it. It's just, you know, what if what Dude, if you shot if an arrow that just bomb? <laughs> what if you just shot an arrow that told like racist jokes or something like that? And that was like the whole because oh that's like you can't use it. They're just like, this isn't like you can. It doesn't do anything. But I would just like, why are they warning you not to use it? It's, it's useless in battle, yeah. but it's just going to be really offensive to everybody. It's going to alienate a lot of people. He's like, look, I made this arrow in 2017. <laughs> it was a different time. Uh, the world, you know, we didn't know back then. <laughs> we didn't know. That feels like a real Jeremy Renner move. Yeah, Jeremy Renner. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't surprise me at all if Jeremy Renner is carrying around a racist arrow. <laughs> That's me projecting onto Jeremy <laughs> Renner something stuff that I don't know if has been proven or not. It's all conjecture, oh but still, I'm, I'm here for it. He just doesn't want her to fire the arrow because he will get canceled. <laughs> <laughs> what if uh, yeah, what if you could shoot an arrow that would cancel people, and then the kingpin is just <laughs> like goes on BuzzFeed and is just like, "Fuck, uh, I'm ruined." <laughs> And his and then like all the people who work for him, like murdering people and dealing drugs are like, listen, man, we heard you said some pretty inappropriate stuff. I don't think we can work for you anymore. Just inside <laughs> inside the arrow is a, a 10 minute Hannibal Burris set where he draws attention to something that people have known. It's been out in the air for years, but until he draws focus to it. God, that's so funny. The oh, Hannibal man. Burris arrow. Jeez. So, OK, I got another couple of beefs. First off, I don't like the LARPers. The LARPing episode, I thought, the, like the LARPing part of the, I think that was episode two. I thought it was kind of weak. It was playful and it was fun enough that I was like, okay. And then we bring the LARPers back. And then in the finale, we spend a lot of time with the LARPers and nobody is listening to them doing crowd control. So they leave for 10 minutes and put on LARPing gear. And then now that they are in LARPing gear, the crowd will listen to them. That's very stupid. It just felt unnecessary. In a series where too much else was going on that you, you're, you're pointing out one of the dumbest things maybe I've ever seen is just, oh, we'll we'll respect the people playing pretend more than we will. The people who are actively trying to help us evacuate a, a scene, you know, why can't it be under their clothes? 
why can't they like rip yeah. it off and like pull out their stuff the way Hawkeye does? That's immediately I'm on board because the Hawkeyes are like wearing their stuff underneath. What if they're doing the same thing? And then these LARPers are just wearing like medieval armor and pulling out like foam swords and shit. I'd be here for it. I'm here for it. I love it. I like the idea of them being the crew. There was so much there, but you're right. They just didn't land it. They did not land this at all. That is with their first appearance too. I thought it would be fun. And maybe this is something that the creative team considered and rejected, but I thought it'd be really fun if that LARPing scene in episode two, if they'd brought in a unit that worked on like fucking game of Thrones, like if they'd brought in people that had worked on like medieval fantasy things before, and they shot it exactly like an epic medieval fantasy people just happen to be wearing felt like i think that would achieve the comedic effect that they wanted but again it's like kate and her mom there's just not enough contrast to make it clear what they wanted the joke to be because the portrayal of them you know the larpers put their costumes on and now people listen to them the larpers aren't in on the joke that's a joke at the larpers expense like it is condescending to them i feel like they are the butt of that is it a joke? What's what are we supposed to feel when the LARPers leave for 10 minutes and then put on their costumes? I think we're supposed to laugh and clap. We're supposed to. Why would we laugh, though? Why would we laugh at laugh at them for? I mean, it's a dumb thing to do. It's dumb in their heads that they think they're more. But there is if they're wearing it under their clothes and they're doing a reveal like Hawkeye, then that is like re. That's reinforcing the message that Hawkeye drives home, I think, pretty successfully, which is anyone can be a superhero. Anyone can be a superhero. So all these LARPers are out there pretending to be superheroes, but like they're also putting that into action and they're wearing their costumes and they have their identity. And who cares how they're doing it? They're helping, you know, like they're also heroes. But you're right. The way they executed that was weird. It was strange. And I got one more big beef that relates to the LARPers directly. Why didn't we see Grills grill? <laughs> Why did you make him grills if he wasn't going to grill? Is that where he gets his name from in the comics? Because he's always grilling? Yeah. It's all those like That's low-key funny. rooftop parties in Hawkeye's apartment building. And I was like, oh, this will be fun. We'll get like a rooftop holiday party or something with the LARPers. Grills will grill. Yes. No yes. such luck. It does not happen. If you're if you're listening at home and you're not familiar with the comic books, the 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 comic this is based on Hawkeye is basically running an apartment building. And in the TV show, the LARPers are pretty much representing like the tenants of the building. Am I am I do it selling that right? They're pretty much filling yeah. into those roles. So you're right. Why isn't why don't we see Grill's grill? <laughs> that's a good I mean, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. I guess they just thought he could just be a grills. There's probably grill. There's bear grills. He's out there. He can. Yeah, we can see him grill in the future. I just want to see him grill. I'd like to think we're going to see him grill at some point. You know, the only saw thing we saw go on a grill was Ronan's costume. Yeah, <laughs> which had previously survived a house fire in the first episode. <laughs> you think it'd be flame retardant from some? It's uh, at the very least, it's releasing toxic fumes into the app. Like uh, you can't be. You don't burn pressurized wood. You don't burn Avenger level costumes. It's just it doesn't seem very nice. Hawkeye in general, bury it yeah. or something, you know, do a bonfire. Really just the family grill. And now you have to clean that up next time. Next burger you eat is going to have a little bit of Ronin on it. You know, next hot dog is going to have the blood of your enemies, you know, just kind of burnt <laughs> onto it. Like that's the char mark you want in your buns is just the sweet taste of you know, victory over all these countless baddies. It's weird. See, I think that's disgusting personally. <laughs> Me too. I, we've talked about the LARPing a lot, but like, I don't know what they were trying to do. If they were trying to, are they making fun of the LARPers? Are they, you know, I feel like there's a lot of overlap probably between LARPers and Marvel fans, right? <laughs> like comic book nerds. <laughs> yeah. So like, I don't know why they're attacking them. At the end of the day, it seems like they kind of present them as like, you know, lovable characters and their respect them and all that. But yeah, you're right. That costume thing is effing weird. I just think they didn't frame it very well, but I think you found a much better way to frame it on the show just now. I know I'm, I'm incredible. I should be, I should be writing for these shows. Thank you, Kevin, for saying that. You should be. Tim, we've talked about a lot of beefs. Do you have any thieves? Do I have any thieves? I mean, kind of already talked about the thieves. Yelena, Kate, Clint Barden. These are all thieves. Uh, the the owl stealing the tiny bus. That really did it for me mm. in this. The, the fight scene between Yelena and Kate 
uh, in the building was amazing. Oh, yeah. The two of them just going at it in like a long shot. It was like super fun, pretty grounded. Then both running down the side of the building. Like there's so much to like in this finale. All the arrows, like all like Hawk, like the, the scenes where the Hawkeyes are just shooting all these arrows and you're seeing them all like blow people up or like electrocute people. That's awesome. It's like that's exactly what I wanted from this movie. It's the from the show. I mean, it's so cool. It's so grounded. We end up on the Barden farm having like a Christmas thing. It's just like there's so much about this to like. There really is. Uh, I don't know if I have a, a single thief there, but I just listed a bunch of I mean, there's a lot to like about this. I thought. What about you? Yeah. Do you have a single thief? Do you have like some? Did anything stand out to you? The one that I had that you didn't mention was Kate joining the Bartons for Thanksgiving. I thought it was really nice for Christmas. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Wow. Way to blow it, Kev. Let's take that again. <laughs> we won't. <laughs> oh, we sure won't. Yeah, I think overall, look, there's a lot of there's more here to like than to hate. I think overall too much happened in this episode. And a note that I would have liked for the series overall in hindsight was I think I would have liked like miniature arcs over the course of it. So maybe if like Maya is the antagonist at the start, but we wrap her up by episode three and then we start with Yelena in episode four and we wrap her up by episode six, kind of like taking some of the stuff. Yeah. Like the mom arc kind of having that run its own course, spacing it out so that everything doesn't end in this episode because it made this one, it made the pace a lot more frenetic than any of the other ones. And it felt the least confident in what the series was like of the entire series, which I thought was kind of strange for a finale. I agree. I think they really it seemed like they really wanted to do like a cutesy work tying up everything in the finale, like all at once, which I mean, that's kind of a TV. Th- but I mean, you're right. And like a TV show, when you've got a whole season, like you need little things. There can be little there can be multiple arcs in a season. I mean, I I'm inclined to agree with you. I didn't really like Maya's whole thing. You know, maybe I'm jumping the gun on reckless speculation, but like there's supposed to be an echo TV show. I can't tell you how uninterested I am in, <laughs> in the Echo TV show. Words can't describe how uninterested I am in watching that the the guy with the neck tattoo and the girl, the deaf woman with the missing leg. What are they going to do? They're going to go be boring somewhere and just <laughs> talk about how awful the kingpin is. What's what's good the show possibly be? What else is there to explore with these characters? There's nothing as far as I can tell. I think I think if somebody gets their hands on it, they could do something interesting with it here. I think it or there. I think here it suffered from being mixed in with everything else. I think it would have been better if they could have like highlighted it a little bit differently. Like I mentioned, with like a miniature arc and having it play out on a shorter time scale. I don't need to see neck tattoo guy ever again. Like that character, get out of here. I thought Maya's introduction was really cool. Um, and I would like to see more of her, but I would like to see somebody else do kind of what we talked about here, where the second appearance tends to lock things in. I want to see somebody lock her in. I think there's like a, there's good clay there and I want to see like a really good creative team mold that character into something great. Here's, here's what I'm thinking Speaking, right now. Oh, sorry. I want to ask you this oh, question because I love it when you put me on the spot or call me out on stuff. Am I being... The, this the actress or the actor who plays Echo is is like a deaf actor who this is like her first job, right? That was something mm-hmm. we, we've talked about off air. Am I am I like biased against her because she's deaf? Does that make her less charismatic? Right? Like, is is it harder to like somebody who doesn't speak? Isn't that a harder acting challenge? Right? Like we talked about Yolana, Kate, we love right away. But they have a lot of dialogue. Yolanda says a bunch of funny stuff that goes. She's not she's not funny. She's not she's not saying anything interesting. She can only communicate by, you know, this boring tattoo neck guy actually saying words for her. Like this seems like a really hard challenge. And I guess I'm wondering if it's or who could possibly pull off a role where you don't talk. I mean, now you're into talking about like Keanu Reeves level, like just dead silence, you know, and somehow being compelling. Like it just seems like a huge acting challenge to play a deaf character. 
and have the charisma of like a Yolanda or Kate or potentially carry a series, you know? I don't think it's impossible at all. I think right now you're probably reacting more to the fact that she is a first time actor in something of this magnitude. And also, like you mentioned that a lot of her lines were being funneled through who I consider to be a very bad actor at the neck tattoo guy. Um, I think he was a huge hit, uh, that kept things back. I, I liked her personally. I was when we, when we found out afterwards that that was her first acting role, I was like, are you shitting me? Like, this is insane. I thought she did great, especially considering that. And I think the, the pros of hiring someone who has that lived experience outweigh any kind of a con of like her, maybe not having as much experience in previous projects as other people on this project. But again, I I think that's something that in future appearances, like she's going to keep locking in the creative team's going to keep locking it in. I think this is just the first exposure to a character. Yelena we've seen before. Um, Kate, we haven't seen before, but Haley Steinfeld's a screen regular. I mean, she was in True Grit. Like, she's been around forever. Uh, Jeremy Renner, we've seen before. Kingpin, unfortunately, we've seen before. Like, most of the other people in this are either, like, very seasoned actors or we've directly seen them in the MCU. So, I don't think it's a fair fight. Okay. Okay, then maybe I'll be opt. I'll try and be more optimistic going forward. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'm ready. I mean, I'll watch. Honestly, I'll watch whatever they put out. So what am I complaining about? (laughs) (laughs) Well, would you watch this, Tim? I want to bring a segment back from the dead. Take it or leave it. I'm going to pitch something to you. You got to tell me if you would take this change to the series or if you're going to leave it on the table. Vincent D'Onofrio is fired from the MCU, but his replacement as Kingpin is John Travolta. Do you take that or leave it? <laughs> um, oh, man. I kind of... Uh, I'll tell you what, age is the only thing that's that's holding me back. Like, 10 years ago, John Travolta, 100% I'm taking it. I think I'm still taking John Travolta. I think it'd be great. Like he was, he was a gangster in Swordfish. Was he in? Wasn't yeah. he in one of the Punisher movies as like a bad yeah. guy too? First like, Punisher. He's done the big like gangster guy. I don't know if he has like the physical stature for it, but I mean, he'd be a great villain. He'd be such a good villain in like this kind of street level role. Maybe it could be like Hammerhead or something like that. I mean, oh, he'd be a great Hammerhead uh, man. You know who would have been great for Kingpin like probably 10, 10, 15 years ago? Ray Liotta. Ray Liotta is another fellas. good one. I mean, Ray Liotta would be a great. I mean, we're, all t- we're just talking about like good gangster guys, you know? Yeah. I think the tough thing is Jim finding. Pesci. I think Vince <laughs> Joe Pesci as Kingpin would be amazing. I think we get hung up on the on the Kingpin's appearance because it is his look is like iconic. And Vincent D'Onofrio looks like the kingpin. I also think Vincent D'Onofrio could just do a better job. I don't know who's directing. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen him in other movies and he talks normal. He's he can he doesn't talk like that, you know? He that's a character choice he's making. He could make less choices. I think we're also in the minority here. It seems like everybody Dude. likes him, and I feel like I'm going crazy watching this. If you'd only seen him in daredevil and men in black you would be like who is this guy <laughs> and men in black <laughs> oh my God. yeah that's the character he should bring back sugar water <laughs> that was good thanks man that's one of my best impressions more damn <laughs> <laughs> the kingpin kingpin what do you want sugar water more <laughs> <laughs> uh, shit. Um, ready to wrap this up Kevin yeah I'll wrap it up on this another segment bringing back from the grave money well spent yes. this show was an average of 25 million dollars per episode that's 150 million dollars total 4.7 hours of content money well spent my god I mean for context the Mandalorian season one was 15 mil per episode. 
uh, HBO's Watchmen series with Regina King that was also 15 mil per episode. Uh, the Flash, the DC series that's on what, like CBS or whatever? Yeah. Um, that is 50 million a season. <laughs> that looks like it's 50 million a season. <laughs> this, I think this is what what these shows cost. I think this is what we're expecting mm. every Marvel thing to cost. And this is what we're expecting every Disney plus show to cost. And I think it looks pretty good for, for what it is, you know, like I think they win with these low budgets by not doing as much CGI as they, they could, you know, like vision flying around is not a great choice for a TV show, right? Hawkeye, you know, running through the streets of New York and shooting people with arrows. That's a pretty (laughs) budget friendly thing to do. Right. And I don't know, there's definitely parts where like the budget is like a weakness where it looks like, you know, like the car chase in one of the early episodes, I kind of liked where they do like the giant arrow on the bridge, but like the way that is Mm -hmm. shot, it just looks kind of stilted and and weird. And I mean, there's definitely moments where like the budget leaks through, but I got to tell you, I'm pretty impressed in general with how good the Disney plus shows look like. But I mean, this show, I thought, looked basically like a Marvel movie. What do you what do you think? Yeah, right there with you. Everything you just said. I mean, I think the the ideal way that you deal with that constraint is you do what the Marvel movies have always had as a strength anyway, which is you lean into character and characterization and dramatic tension between these people that you care about. And then you don't need the vision flying around. It's more interesting to have the vision in a living room wondering what is going on and if his wife has mind wiped him in the entire town like that's way more interesting i think they could all do less all these tv shows could do less you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) less of the cgi stuff give us more character stuff i'm i'm surprised how good these things look but i mean they're spending movie money on this this i mean 100 140 million is a is a grown-up budget you know oh my god no way home's budget was 200 million (laughs) Yeah. So when you put it like that, it seems like, oh, this is crazy. Then they they fucked up. That's what it feels like. (laughs) (laughs) No way home (laughs) for 60 more, 60 million more dollars. You get no way home. Okay. These are the song. It was like half the length, though. I guess that's true. That's true. You're right. Plus, they don't have to pay Jeremy Renner. Yeah. Jeremy Renner was half that budget. Probably bringing home his 50 million dollar. He made 15 mil for Endgame. Who did? Jeremy Renner. Made 15 mil mil for end game. Yeah, I like I saw like a budget breakdown for all these guys other than like Robert Downey Jr. who gets bank every single thing. It's like they do a solo movie, make like 20, 30 million dollars. Then they do the Avengers, make like two million dollars and they go back to a solo movie, make a shit ton of money. It's like it's kind of crazy how big a pay cut these guys are taking for like the 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 ensemble cast. uh roles i mean they're all millionaires and they're all probably super successful and i can only imagine like incredibly happy uh so um you know whatever but yeah you're right great category kevin i'm proud of you for bringing it back hey thanks man yeah well everybody out there thank you so much for listening to our triumphant return for 2022 what did you think of this episode uh (laughs) answer the poll that's up on spotify Nice. Uh, poll. What do you want to do for the the poll for this one, Tim? Let's have it be like. Uh, what do you think? If all now, then there's only two options. <laughs> <laughs> Is this an open end poll or like a yes no question? It's just a general. I mean, if we can do open ended, then it should be what should Hawkeye's most dangerous arrow have done? Okay, that's really good. We'll do that. That'll be on the poll. If you're on Spotify, listening on Spotify, check that out. Give us a vote, and then we'll read it at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty nice. Thanks for listening, everybody. Stay nerdy. Bye. Bye.